everybody. It's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Let's get that out. Welcome to Thursday, uh, June the 25th. You are here probably for a webinar with the Narrative Initiative, and we're going to get to that in just a quick second. And no, your computer's not broken. Playing you a little bit of music. This is Ella's song from Sweet Honey in the Rocks, a request from our friends, Narrative Initiative. I'm going to just let it play for a minute or two, and then I'm going to yak at you as we get everybody into the room. We've got a full house today, about 500 people expected to be with us. And so while you all are entering the room, I see people still coming in. If you've been with us before, I'm going to turn this down just a little bit because I imagine I'll get a complaint or two from someone in a minute. Bless you. Uh, we're going to do something we've been doing with network webinars over the last many months, which is we're grateful for the music that doesn't. Yeah, it's a great song, isn't it? Yeah, just let's enjoy it for a quick minute and I'll, I'll talk again. <laughs> Okay, still folks coming in. Sweet Honey in the Rock, Ella's song. Lovely, lovely song. Hey, Jenny. Yeah, I'll turn it down a little bit in a minute, but you don't really need to hear what I have to say too, too much. But here's what I am going to ask you to do. If you can go into the chat, and Jenny's already done this, and uh, Doretta's in there as well. And you're right, Doretta, this is not puppets or cartoons. That's been my experience. That or Taylor Swift has been on blast in our house. Um, if you would, go ahead into the chat. If you're with us for the first time, this may be new to you. If you've been with us before, then you know this. Go into the chat, add your name, where you're coming in from, and then we're borrowing an idea from Professor Brene Brown, and that is a two-word check-in. So just two words, how are you feeling right now? There's no good answer, by the way. It's just whatever you got going on in your head. Uh, so if you would, and make sure you're talking to, and this is worth knowing because I've got to reset mine, make sure you're talking to all panelists and attendees. Because not only is this a webinar, but we're really trying to make it a community gathering. So we want you to be talking to one another. If you hear something or see something's interesting and you want to share it with other people, feel free to use the chat for that. We will use, hey, Ellen, how are you? Energized and hopeful. That's a good way to be. We will also be using the Q&A box later on when we get to the Q&A portion of our conversation. But a couple quick pieces of housekeeping before we get underway. We are recording this webinar. So if you have a friend or colleague who wasn't able to be with us, we will have it up on comnetwork.org and on our YouTube channel within the next couple of hours or certainly by sometime tomorrow. We are also making notes as we always do in Google Docs. So our colleague, Carrie Klein, is doing that. She's also monitoring the chat. So if there's a link that's offered up, during the course of this conversation, we'll make sure to put it in there. And in addition, our colleague, Gab Sarah Ferris, who's sheltering in place down in Washington, D.C. Yabby is taking notes on Twitter. We're all gathering around the hashtag ComNetLive. It's C-O-M-N-E-T-L-I-V-E. So feel free to chit-chat with one another. Kendra, how are you, my friend? Let's see. It's going by alive and breathing. That is a good way to be. Adina, Dan, Susan, oh, Kevin, how are you? Uh, Jamala, lots of folks, you guys are almost going too fast for me now, but I'm grateful that you're all checking in and let's take care of each other this next hour. So if you see somebody struggling a little bit, see if you can offer a little bit of help. Let's be in community together. With that, I'm gonna turn down the music just a little bit. Again, if you're listening to this Sweet Honey in the Rock, Ella's song, it's wonderful. I'm just gonna turn it down a little bit. I'm gonna tell you a couple quick things. Tired and hopeful, Madison, yeah. There are these polarities, right? Where we're feeling these two things that are really kind of a challenge, you wouldn't expect to feel them at the same time. Seems to be something like our new normal for at least the next little while. Uh, who loves Sweet Honey in the Rock? All right. Uh, Robin. Yeah, they are wonderful. Okay, gang. Uh, Tristan, if you would take the slides, my partner in crime, Tristan Mahabir is running our deck uh, until I hand it over to our friends from the Narrative Initiative. A couple quick things to tell you about. Com Network Local. So y'all probably know this, but if you don't, there are 17 cities now uh, around the country where network members gather together. It's free and the idea is just to build community in the places where you live and work. Right now, building community kind of looks like this. We're on Zoom. But there are 17 cities and we will put a link in here so you can find out if one of those cities might be where you live or near where you live. But they're in places like Boston and DC, Miami, Atlanta, Detroit, Chicago, San Francisco, LA, Denver, Austin. I'm gonna forget other people, or forgive me, but suffice to say, 17 cities around the country where you can gather with folks, so that's a wonderful thing. Tristan, if you would, go ahead and advance for me. This is also something, hopefully you've seen some of the work that we've been doing, whether it's been in the form of gathering people as we did with Dr. Clarence Jones just a couple of weeks ago, uh, but you may also be mindful about a year ago with the help of Michelle Norris, the former NPR All Things Considered anchor, and also uh, the creator of the Race Card Project, she helped us build this thing that we called the racism issue. And it's a really wonderful resource. We have some terrific pieces in there. Highly encourage you to check this out. Uh, one I'd particularly call out for you is our friend Travian Shorters, uh, who was a keynoter last year at ComNet in Austin when we were down in Texas. 
uh, writes about asset framing and how important that is and a challenge maybe for many of us in the sector who tend to define things through deficits. And that's something Travian sort of in, in short would say, how do you lift somebody up while you're putting them down? Which is what a lot of us do, perhaps without intention, but, but something to be mindful of. And it's a wonderful, really easy, quick read there. Tristan, if you would advance for us, please. This is the other thing I want to tell you about. So chances are you're on our email list, and that means chances are you saw the news that ComNet 20 in Atlanta has been canceled. And I'm sure you get why, right? Like there's a pandemic going on. We can't reasonably safely expect to bring any kind of groups of folks together. So we're not going to. So we have canceled ComNet. But we know that our purpose, which is to connect, gather, and inform our field, folks working in communications for good, that remains true. And our core values, which are community, learning, and leadership, well, they just haven't changed. So we feel compelled to try to go ahead and try to bring us together, much as we are today. We're going to do it virtually, and we're calling this thing V. Uh, one thing, you'll hear more about this in the coming days, but I just want to flag for you, so maybe we can deputize everybody here to help me get the word out about this, or help us all get the word out about this. It's going to be two forms of V. V is going to show up as a content event online, much as we had planned for Atlanta. We're going to focus on the South. We're going to focus on equity and health through the course of the conversations we'll have together. Nicole Hannah-Jones is going to be with us. She's the creator of the 1619 Project and a reporter at the New York Times. She's just done some extraordinary work. In fact, she won the Pulitzer Prize this year for that work. Joy Harjo, who is the first Native woman to be named U.S. Poet Laureate. She's also just a badass activist. She's going to be with us. Rich Besser, who used to run the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, is currently president of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, just told us the other day he's going to be with us. Uh, Alexis McGill Johnson, who is the CEO of Planned Parenthood, she's going to be with us. We have a couple more names we'll announce in the coming days, and registration for V will open. For some of you, maybe later this week, for most of us, probably next week. Uh, and really quickly, let me just tell you, there's a distinction, somewhat different, right? V will be a content event with all those folks I just named. It's going to happen between September 23rd and the 25th. So block out your calendars. And we're also going to create an experience. And by the way, that's going to be free. Everything that we're offering at V will be free. We're going to suggest you make a donation to an Atlanta area nonprofit. And so we've named six or seven with some help from our host committee that we're going to suggest you make a donation to. You don't have to, but it'd be a cool, kind thing to do. And then V plus is something we're going to do. It's more of an extended experience for those of you that come to the network conference. And one of your big hopes is I want to build community. I want to meet new people. I want to expand my network. That's what V plus is going to be all about. And that'll start in early September, maybe mid September before we gather for V you'll go through the V experience with everybody else, but you'll have a dedicated cohort of colleagues that you're going to do that with. And the experience is going to extend down through the election, probably into December. And so the idea is that that's really what you're after is a chance to not only experience all the, the learning and the knowledge and the insights that we can glean from all these wonderful folks who will be with us, including breakout sessions and everything else. If you want to extend that experience and really focus on community building, V plus will be for you. And we will charge you a small fee for that, but we're going to send you a care package and do a bunch of other really neat stuff to ensure that's a really valuable, worthwhile thing. Unfortunately, just in order to make it an intimate, meaningful experience, we're going to limit the number of folks there. So maybe 600 folks will be able to accommodate with V plus V. We're going to build a much bigger boat. We're going to try to make space for at a start 2000. If we need to make it even bigger, we will. So feel free to tell friends about that. That's all coming very, very soon. And with that, maybe I should stop yakking at you and get to the good stuff, which is I'm going to hand it off to Marquez and Liz and Jacob are just behind the scenes. I think, Jacob, if you could go ahead and fire up your deck, we can go ahead and get underway. And I think, Jacob, you want to share screen, if I'm not mistaken. And once we have the deck up and we can all see it, which is coming now. All right. Off to you. Marquez, take it away, sir. Well, good day to each and every one of you. Thank you, Sean, so very much for all of those lovely introductions and for all of you who have made time to spend time with us today to talk about narrative change. Uh, my name is Marcus Ryan, and we'll do more formal um, introductions shortly, but I want to first say that we are very grateful for this invitation extended by ComNet um, hosting narrative initiative. If you are wondering what our mission is, it's a little team called Making Justice and Equity Common Sense. We have reached an inflection point and we are facing a lot of different converging crises. And I don't have to recount these to you, but just a few of them are climate change, economic insecurity, social injustice. We have a global pandemic in COVID-19 that has only been worsened by the incompetence coming out of the White House. It's rendered frontline communities so much more vulnerable. We are watching our national, our national healthcare systems under great duress. And we are finding that 
um, that there are disproportionate infection rates among people of color, even as we find black and brown people's lives being taken in the streets by law enforcement officers and white vigilantes. So what do we do with all of this? How do we see this moment, this narrative opening, level the playing field to win justice and equity? Who can advance the slide? I'll pass it on to my colleague, um, Liz Hines, who will get us started in terms of our introductions. Again, thank you all for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus, for that wonderful and grounding introduction um, that lifts up really where we are in this particular moment. Um, uh, we're going to do a quick round of intros from, uh, uh, from myself, from Marcus and Jacob. Uh, before we get into that, I just wanted to go over very quickly the agenda for today. Um, so we'll do a quick welcome and introductions. Um, after that, we're going to talk about what is narrative ex exactly. Uh, I think we've heard a proliferation of this word over the last several years. We're going to talk about why we think it's important um, and how it sort of structures um, the way that we communicate with each other and understand the world. Um, after that, we're going to move into a set of slides uh, that talks about uh, moves us from kind of a theory space to a practice space. What does it actually look like to uh, implement narrative change strategy? Um, how do we do, how do we go from concept to practice? Um, we're going to lift up after that the power of futures thinking, which I think has also become very prominent um, type of discussion in communications and organizing very recently. Um, and then dig into how do we start uh, these types of processes together um, to close out. Uh, so before we get into the content of the presentation, uh, we're going to all tell you a little bit about ourselves uh, and then take it from there. So I'll just say very briefly, my name is Liz Hines. I'm a program manager at the Narrative Initiative, um, but I come from, like my colleagues, a very interdisciplinary background. Um, I started my career in direct services and ho housing advocacy. Uh, I have experience in uh, the public education and higher education system. Uh, politics and philanthropy. Uh, and I also like to say I'm very, very happy to be at Narrative Initiative where I can also put my hard earned English degree back to work after several years. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'll pass now um, to Marcus to do a brief introduction there. Certainly. And thank you for that, uh, Liz. Uh, we have noted that I have a little bit of a sound challenge, so we'll work on that as we go along. But again, my name is Marcus. Uh, my pronouns are they and them. I am uh, part of the program staff at Narrative Initiative. Before I came to Narrative Initiative, I've been working at the nexus of art and culture, justice and equity. I have a background in popular education and transmedia storytelling for racial, economic, and health justice, not only across the United States, but also internationally. I'll pass along to Jacob. Hi, y'all. I'm so excited to be with you here today. Uh, my name is Jacob Swenson Wingell. I use he, him pronouns. Um, and I'm the Director of Communications and Narrative at Pennsylvania Stands Up, a new statewide organization in the state of Pennsylvania. And before that, I was a program manager at Narrative Initiative with Liz and Marcus. Um, and my background is also very interdisciplinary. Um, I have a background in communications and organizing, in popular education, and in academia. Um, I started doing community uh, organizing and communications work when I was uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, and I'm really fascinated by big ideas um, and how we engage with them. Um, from the wood panel seminar room to the church basement um, and in marches and rallies. So great to be with you today. So Jacob, if we can go to the next slide. Um, we're going to say just a little bit about um, how we understand narrative um, before we get into why we think it's super important. So at the Narrative Initiative, um, our staff is very reflective of the idea that we build on a history of narrative change work that connects people across disciplines, geographies, and issues, uh, right? Narrative is a team sport. Uh, everybody has heard a lot about narrative as a word that gets bandied about. Um, we also want to acknowledge that this work is not new. It draws from a rich legacy of disciplines, um, whether it's organizing, research, culture making or culture change, technology, philanthropy, 
uh, and policy advocacy and strategic communications, we believe that narrative change is a team sport and it's an interdisciplinary approach that aligns with our understanding that we can't just do this through communication staff or even really through one single but perhaps powerful organization or entity. Um, folks need to come together, um, build narrative together, uh, and drive it through uh, multiple disciplines out in the world. Um, our approach is informed by those practices across from different sectors. We draw different practices and different tactics from many, many different spaces um, and build narrative change work um, with folks who bring in their own expertise, their own knowledge and experience to make the entire kind of process of building a narrative change strategy stronger. Um, and with that, I will um, kick it back to you, Jacob, for the next slide. Yeah, so um, this may be different uh, than the way that other folks uh, have been engaging in communications work. I know that um, when I started out as a young communications volunteer, um, I saw a big part of my role uh, was about communicating the mission of our organization um, and educating the public about the policy issues that we were working on as we advocated um, for particular uh, solutions. Um, and when we talk about narrative, we're talking about stepping back and thinking about those day-to-day -day tasks inside of a bigger framework. Um, and at Narrative Initiative, one of the thinkers who has influenced our thinking about narrative is the cultural theorist, Stuart Hall. Um, Paul said that the languages, the concepts, categories, imagery of thought, and systems of representation, which different groups deploy in order to make sense of, define, figure out, and render intelligible the way, the so way society works, um, are important to pay attention to. And that's what we think about when we think about narrative. Um, I just want to give a, a quick example. I, I'm guessing this is a concept that's familiar um, to many of you. but. I'd like you to just take a moment um, and close your eyes. Um, we're in the middle of a really busy election year. It's a very contentious election year. Um, and we're having a lot of conversations as a society about leadership in this moment. Um, and I'd like you to just close your eyes and think about um, when you think of a leader, what qualities do they possess? What do they look like? Uh, what are they doing and what are they saying? Um, if you can just reflect on that for a second. And then start, uh, if you could drop uh, just an observation or two um, about what comes to mind. Um, give us your first thought. A lot of times we have thoughts that come up and then we self-censor those and come up with other thoughts. But just what are a couple of the things that come to your mind when you think of a leader? Um, and if you'll put that in the chat, gang, in the chat, put that in the chat, make sure you're directing it to all panelists and attendees so we can each see what you're saying. And yeah, y'all are doing it. This is awesome. So. Good listening, leading by example, thoughtful, deliberate, courageous, visionary, charismatic. I love this. Humble, genuine, they care, they're collaborative, honest. This is great. Um, I think what I want to highlight here, um, there's a lot of lessons that we could draw uh, uh, from the, some of the adjectives that folks are thinking about. Um, but I want to draw out just some of the implications of how we think about leadership. Um, how we think about leaders um, has huge implications for how we think society works, as Stuart Hall um, points out in this quote, about what's fixed and uh, what's possible to change, and about how change happens and who makes change. Um, and so we might contrast one very dominant um, view of leadership that focuses on individuals with a set of qualifications, maybe holding a particular office um, or title, um, but there are other concepts of leadership, which I think you all are highlighting in the chat. The idea that leadership is a collective project um, that we exercise together um, uh, through the actions we take, not just in virtue of qualifications um, and title. Um, and thinking about leadership in that way opens up new possibilities um, for our society. Um, I want to go on and quote a second, um, a second quote from Stuart Hall. Um, where he talks about narrative, um, goes on to talk about how these, this idea of narrative relates to power. He says that narrative especially has to do with the concepts and the languages of practical thought, which stabilize a particular form of power and domination. Um, and that's really heavy stuff. Um, Hall goes on to talk about um, the power of narrative, not only to support systems of oppression and harm, but also to undo those systems. Um, and to promote liberty um, and equality and justice. 
Um, and so today we're going to be just digging into the, the, the question of how do we engage at this more fundamental level where we're thinking about narrative as a way to reshape relationships of power and to reshape society in a, in a transformative direction. So I'm going to pass it back to Liz to talk a little bit more about how we think about um, narrative in relationship to messaging, message and storytelling. Thank you, Jacob. Um, yes, and so one of the things that we think about um, at uh, the Narrative Initiative uh, and that we've spent a little bit of time doing to try to understand how narrative functions in society um, is to break it up into its component parts. Um, Jacob, I think there's some animation on that slide, so if you can um, move it um, along there. Yep, thank you. So, uh, Narrative, and we sometimes call this the technology of narrative, right? So how does narrative actually function in society? It's a big word. It means a lot of different things. Uh, but from our perspective, narrative is super important to some of the things that Jacob has been talking to, talking about, and also for a change process because it defines, right? Narrative sets a strategic framework for a conversation. Those narratives define problems in society. They gesture towards specific sets of solutions. They often, often tell us uh, who are the heroes and who are the villains in our story. And they articulate what is a, what can be described as a common sense or a common understanding of our society. Um, to talk about this technology a little bit further, um, we often use a wave metaphor, um, which suggests that Narratives are slippery. I think it's a very, it's a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing to think about how they interact with each other. They are connected, right? Um, but we see at the top of a cresting wave, things like messages and uh, stories. And we want to be clear that we think messages and stories is an expansive category. A story can be a visual, right? It can be a picture on Instagram. Uh, it can be a tweet. Um, it can be auditory. It can be something that you're listening to. Um, stories and messages embody many, many different forms, uh, many, many different mediums, and they are sitting at the top of this wave, right? We are, it's the way that we experience narratives. Um, in the middle, sitting in the middle, is narrative. Uh, we often use that metaphor like tiles are to mosaics, so stories are to narratives. No, stories add up. Stories are component parts of narratives which are whole. And the narratives also point to a logic or a bigger meaning behind a story. Um, and sitting right below that in this wave metaphor um, are what we call deep narratives, right? Uh, they could also be named as values, uh, ideology, or worldview. Deep narratives are the foundations of narratives and stories. They animate us in society. They're held closely and often and sometimes not visible. Um, but these uh, deep narratives in conjunction with narratives, they structure our experience. So while we experience messages and stories, those messages and stories are structured by narratives and deep narratives. These terms are meant to be helpful. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> um, and to help us locate important moments where we can intervene, help us see patterns and themes, um, and give us some, some insight into the strategy about how we might be able to shift dominant narratives that we believe are creating harm. Um, in this particular instance, messaging is an expression of narratives and values, right? So crafting messages with narrative in mind asks us to ground all of the messages, regardless of the moment, in a vision of the future that holds, whether it's for an individual organization or whether you're with partners your messages should be rooted in a worldview, a set of values, and some key dominant narratives that, folk, that you're trying to advance. Um, to that end, I, we think that narrative change strategies can be most effective when they're built and held in networks and coalitions. That is to say, as we've been pointing to in the beginning part of this uh, presentation, that this is a team sport, not an individual pursuit. Um, and to give us kind of some, uh, some handles to hold on to, some examples that we have been researching recently, um, we're going to go into um, a set of kind of contemporary analysis that we've done so far. Um, Jacob, to the next slide. Um, some of you may have read uh, that we wrote a, kind of a short article about the narratives that we have been seeing um, since the outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, 
Um, we have some access to some social listening, social listening tools and have done some tr traditional media analysis to lift up in this instance, some of the uh, values, some of those deep narratives and narratives that were starting to pop during the pandemic, um, and also think about um, their power and how to be proactive in addressing them when we're thinking about uh, building a more uh, just and inclusive society. Um, so uh, our analysis during um, the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, this is a set of examples. Um, you can read our article um, and we're always happy to talk more about what we've been seeing in other instances, but here are some three uh, dominant narratives that we have seen coming up throughout the pandemic. Um, one, and folks might especially remember this during um, uh, the two, uh, the, the discourse around the relief bills, is that we heard from many different corners that the government could only provide short-term relief to folks, whether it was unemployment, whether it was relief for small businesses, um, that this was not a time to be thinking about the structure of our economy, that our ability to act uh, as a governing body was to provide the short-term relief, but that fundamentally the economy uh, was not going to change because of this pandemic. Um, similarly, we have seen, I think, over and over and over again, uh, a dominant narrative that blames China uh, as a progenitor of the disease, as people who are, who are not giving um, clear or true information to international or other bodies um, as, a play, as, a, as a place of spread. Um, and alongside that, we have often seen uh, discourse around closing the borders and changing our immigration policies. Uh, in order to combat uh, a disease from without, this, despite the fact that the U.S. is uh, an epicenter of the, of, of the virus. And third, we see another um, important uh, dominant narrative about how health is a result of personal choice. And we see this in many different ways, some of it in the kind of the patchwork way in which states have approached this issue, um, and also in some other very specific instances um, uh, about whether the choices that you make will get you sick or keep you well, and that it has nothing to do about whether or not you have health insurance, whether you're still employed, whether you're in an epicenter of, of, of the virus and whatnot. And we, um, uh, we saw that these dominant narratives also rest on a set of deep narratives um, that we see echoing, that we often see echoing, right? So one of those narratives is that we can't change. We can fiddle around the edges, um, but fundamentally, our structures are sound, they are okay, um, and actually, we don't have the ability to change them in some ways that they're natural. Um, we also, we see that tied to kind of the relief bills. Um, we also see uh, a deep narrative around white nationalism, something that points to who belongs in this country and who doesn't. What are the policy instruments that we do to maintain safety for those people in the in-group? Um, and then who is, not ex who is not included and who is the, who is the enemy in that story? So uh, the, the China narrative is, is pretty clear in, in pointing to that, as well as the uh, adjustment to immigration policy that's been happening for the last couple of months. Um, and finally, your health as a result of your choices is rooted very deeply in a personal responsibility um, deep narrative. And we see these expressed in a bunch of different types of messages whether it's a tweet, whether it's something from a governor's office, whether it's the president. So wearing a mask as a personal choice is something that we've seen pretty consistently from the presidential administration, from the, from the executive branch. The cure can't be worse than the disease was a very strong message that was um, brought forth by the GOP during the relief bills. So here we have a set of uh, dominant narratives resting on a set of very important deep narratives that proliferate and we experience through messages daily. Um, Jacob, will you go to the next slide? Um, and as uh, at the same time that we're experiencing the pandemic, we have also seen uprisings across the country, uh, protesting police brutality, demanding racial, racial justice. These protests have been multiracial, multi-generational. Um, and are also contending with a set of deep narr of, of dominant narratives that I think that we're, all of us are pretty familiar with. And they are not just um, dominant narratives in this moment of uprising and resistance. Um, they have been very strong and important dominant narratives in the longer and broader discussion around criminal justice reform and justice in general for, for decades in our country. 
Um, so I'll just go ahead and highlight a few of those observations. These were done uh, with less rigorous research, um, but we are, in, we are awash in uh, traditional and non-traditional media information that kind of lifts up some of these uh, dominant narratives as well. So the first one that I think that we've seen pretty consistently, consistently around criminal justice reform and police reform is, oh, it's just a few bad apples. We just need reform. Um, that does not question the underlying assumptions about having uh, a police department and having the police responsible for a wide set of activities. Um, the second, and we see that resting on that same deep narrative of we can't change. Right, the, the police departments across the country cannot fundamentally be restructured. We can change them, we can fiddle around the edges, but, this, but we cannot mess with the structure, right? The second one is a dominant narrative as black people as agitators, right? Which also connects deeply to this white nationalist deep narrative um, that we see in parts of our country. So black people gathering together to protest violence and murder in their communities become framed as agitators, become framed as looters, become framed as people who are out of control or are perpetuating chaos. Um, often you'll see like socialists and anarchists looped in, uh, lumped into this group, both in the COVID discourse and um, in this, uh, in this discourse as well. Um, and finally, um, also a very, very strong dom uh, dominant narrative in criminal justice reform discourse in general is you get what you deserve. If you do the crime, then you do the time, right? And that, in fact, what you deserve is something punitive as opposed to something restorative. Um, and if you are a protester and you're out there and you happen to get caught by the police, that's your choice that you made and you're responsible for it and you should be able to swallow the punitive measures that you receive. So this rests on that same narrative of personal responsibility. Um, and we have some examples that also exist across the political spectrum in some ways. One is Eight Can't Wait, which lifts up a set of police reforms, which, you know, if you look at the data, have been implemented in many places and have not curbed violence, uh, but seem like a more moderate approach um, to police reform in this moment. And we also see very extreme messages around this, like Tom Cotton's op-ed um, about sending in the troops after um, days of protest in New York. Uh, DC and other, other places. Now, one thing I want to note on this, the send in the troops um, message is that there was a tremendous amount of pushback to that op-ed. And in fact, we see there's a language contest going on between how people frame uh, prote protest as either protest riots and looting or uprising. And you see very much now in the media a mixed bag between riot and uprising. Um, and what we think, uh, or how we think about narrative is that narrative is a contest. Narrative is a thing to be cont contested, to be moved, to be pushed, and that narrative moves depending on like where we are in what moment in society. So when you see traditional media, when you see leaders from across political spectrums grappling with things like uprising or riot, you know we're in a real contest about uh, what the dominant narrative in our society is going to be. Um, so I'm going to pause there um, and uh, pass it back to Jacob uh, to talk about um, some, a, a different set of narratives that we've also seen kind of moving through society of late. Thanks, Liz. Yes, uh, let's do think it's all bad news. Uh, we have seen uh, the work that many of you on this call are doing along with many others. Um, to move an alternative set of messages and stories, um, narratives and values. Um, I just wanted to lift up a couple of um, current uh, messages and stories that we've seen. Um, one was the people's bailout effort, um, which was lifting up an alternative set of solutions and ideas about how to, um, how to help the country heal um, and get back on track in the face of COVID um, and the economic downturn. And then also we've seen uh, Black Lives Matter and a set of uh, messages and stories um, around defending Black lives, lives in recent weeks. Um, and um, I just wanna talk about a, a couple more things building on what Liz said. One is that the messages and stories change pretty regularly. Um, we've seen some of these messages and stories repeatedly over the last several years, but they have uh, longer roots connecting to 
some of these same narratives and values um, that it have expressed themselves in different ways in the past. So you can see a precedent to the people's bailout language in Occupy Wall Street. You can see um, a, a precedent to many of the messages and stories about Black Lives Matter um, in the uprisings following the beating of Rodney King in 1992 and also in the civil rights movement. Um, so, um, but those different messages and stories which are connecting to the present moment um, are anchored in a deeper set of narratives and values that advocates for equity and justice have been advancing for years. Um, and I think that also um, uh, ties to something um, that we talk a lot about um, at Narrative Initiative, which is just when we address uh, narratives, we're thinking about a different time frame. It takes many, many different conversations, many storytelling campaigns, messaging campaigns, to begin to make progress in shifting such fundamental ideas. Um, and if that's a kind of repetition. I, um, I wanted to show this quote from uh, Mackenzie Price, um, who did an interview with the nonprofit Quarterly um, last year, um, and just spoke to this, I think, really beautifully. She said, a, a reframed narrative moves through public consciousness in large part by being present and by repetition. But repeating a narrative doesn't mean telling the same story over and over and over. Repetition is not using the exact same example or featuring the exact same person in your newsletter. Repetition is about continuously appealing to categories of values, examples, messengers, and stories. It's not about saying the exact same thing over and over again, but rather identifying these larger categories and staying loyal, in a sense, to those categories continuing with that kind of fidelity. Um, and I just think that that quote is, is really beautiful. Um, and we wanna move now to talking about how do we build that fidelity um, and that intentionality about how we're staying anchored in deep messages or in deep narratives as we do our messaging and communications work. Um, and uh, we developed a, a, a model at Narrative Initiative to think about uh, how we can lead narrative change campaigns that might span um, several years um, and take time to, to really see an impact. Um, the model came out of the work that our program director at Narrative Initiative, Rachel Whitinger, and I did in 2018, working with a narrative change project in Minnesota led by a coalition of 22 different community, faith, and labor organizations, working in a really different set of communities, um, black, white, brown, um, in urban centers and in rural communities. Um, and that uh, set of groups had come together and they'd already taken a really huge and important first step, which was to create a new narrative. Um, we often do some of that work inside of our organization. This was a coalition of 22 groups who'd already brought their members together, um, identified a set of new narratives um, that they called Minnesota Values um, that they wanted to lift up to talk about who Minnesotans are and what they believe in. Um, an example of one of those narratives was uh, that Minnesotans are people who care about one another. And they used a whole bunch of stories and images to convey that. Um, uh, the image of pushing your neighbor's car out of the snow was poignant uh, in Minnesota, as well as the idea of a potluck where people bring different things um, to share, including hot dish. I know there's some Minnesotans. I saw you weigh in on the chat, so <laughs> you can solicit about hot dish. Um, but uh, so they had done this create uh, step and they also were spending a lot of time focused on deployment, which I think is where a lot of us live as communication um, professionals, thinking about how do we push our messages and stories into the media, out online. Um, but as Rachel and I were talking, we realized that when we stepped back, we also needed to think about two other very important steps uh, in the process. One of those is how do we translate the the big ideas, the big deep narratives that we have um, to really connect to the audiences that we're uh, engaging in an authentic way. Um, and so just to go back to the example of care um, in Minnesota, we had to think about how caring for others, um, for instance, showed up uh, with a group that um, was a workers uh, center, pr primarily working with Latino workers, thinking about uh, how does care, up, care show up in a conversation around the minimum wage and workers' rights. Similarly, with an environmental organization in the state, thinking about how does care show up um, when it comes to the environment? What does it mean to care for one another when we're talking about a pipeline that will be built in our neighborhood? Um, 
so uh, the translate step is, is very important. Um, uh, and then we also need to take time to step back and observe together to look at what's happening in the narrative landscape, um, which is um, some of the work that uh, Liz has been doing at Narrative Initiative over the last several months. Um, and in Minnesota, we took time to do that as well. Um, there are a couple things that I want to highlight about this model that I think makes it helpful and unique. One is we call them the four baskets because they're a set of ingredients that we bring to the process of narrative change. But because we think about narrative change as an interdisciplinary effort, um, there, are, there are quite a few different practices, tools, research methodologies that we can bring to bear in each of these four areas. Um, the helpful thing about the model is that we can use this model as an audit to help think about how we're spending time and resources, where we're investing. Some organizations and coalitions might um, spend a lot of time in one area and not another, and thinking about it in this way helps you think about where you're spending your time. Um, uh, and then uh, it also is a, this process also places a heavy emphasis on alignment. Um, creating a new narrative requires a kind of intentionality, getting people in the room together to identify the narrative you want to move. And then I think the translate step is, is unique as well. Um, we often think about message discipline, about data and, and, um, and the importance of using data and driving a message home. But Translate uh, asks, asks us to be comfortable um, uh, with the tension of holding many different messages that are pushing in the same direction and recognize that that has uh, deep power as well. Um, and I wanted to just show one example of, of how that Translate um, worked in Minnesota. We talk about this um, approach to narrative change as a polyvocal approach, meaning that it, it harnesses many different voices. Um, and that's a term that predates narrative initiative. But um, this is a slide just showing what that looked like in the context of a campaign where one of the groups in Minnesota was headed to the Supreme Court to testify about the Muslim ban. And other groups um, sent out tweets uh, to talk about this issue from their own perspective in terms that resonated with their local communities and members um, in unique ways. And so I won't read the, the slide, but I thought that there was real power in um, in the way that groups talked about these, um, about this issue and, and, and reflected the value of care um, in unique language. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Marcus, who's going to talk a little bit more about futures thinking and how that connects to creating narratives. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Jacob. So how do we create new narratives? What we found at Narrative Initiative is that um, there's some utility in using popular education and participatory grassroots creative processes. For what reason? Well, in order to activate the radical imagination, in order to facilitate alignment across groups, across networks, across cohorts. Um, and all of this is as a precursor to building narrative power or the ability to rewrite the rules of society. Among the many processes and tools that we use at Narrative Initiative uh, is futures thinking. Futures thinking is a way of shifting our, our perspective from the immediacy of current circumstances towards a more aspirational outlook. Now, some of us might be asking the question, why futures? Uh, well, because too often we have been suffering from a crisis of imagination. Just to be frank, I don't know if you feel that, but I often feel that, especially when pressed on all sides. We're suffering from a crisis of imagination and with that, we are leaving the future of society to the rich and the powerful. These are actors who are engaged in and benefiting from racial capitalism. They are removed from the materiality of everyday people's lives. We're talking black and indigenous and other people of color, poor and working class white folks. They have little incentive to, to push towards social responsibility or public accountability. The power of futures thinking is this. One, to shift from our present day problems of futures where justice and equity are common sense, um, and to envision what it is to be and to inhabit the change that we wish to see in the world. So you might be asking, how then do we do this? Very briefly, we identify the desired futures by getting people together in these coalitions and networks and groups. We draw out of them their desired future and the new narratives that they would like to see anchor their efforts. We then reverse engineer in order to identify the narratives that have to change in the present in order to make those futures possible. 
And the third thing that we do is we identify those uh, parties, those other organizations with whom we need to be in coalition in order to align our narrative change efforts. So we identify those desired futures, we reverse engineer, and we identify who else needs to be brought along. If you could, uh, Jacob, just advance to the next slide. You'll see here now um, representations of Arab futurisms, Latinx futurisms, and Afrofuturisms which we sometimes use as launch pads to stimulate the future's thinking on earthing new narratives. It's important, we think, that we all see images of future scenarios where there are people of color, not only surviving, but thriving. And this is a means to interrogate not only the present uh, conditions, but future conditions, reimagining the historical as well. In our present day, we have, in our present day, we have, um, two insufficient examples of people of color thriving in futuristic contexts, too few of them. And more importantly, we are engaging in these thought experiments as a means to afford us the opportunity to think outside of the box, ultimately, and to not just do it in our own cubicle, in our own office, as an individual entity, but to do it, again, to, to, as Liz said earlier, as a team sport, to do it in coalition to think outside of the box, to reimagine the uh, pre-existing notions of what is possible, and to center questions of justice and equity, healing and transformation. So whether we're engaging in science fiction or historical fiction, fantasy, Afrofuturism, magical realism, or other non-Western cosmologies, what we're doing is we're aiming to push beyond a commercial consumption of culture and whole people groups. We wanna articulate futures where Black, Indigenous, people of color, poor and working class white folks, everyday people all across the globe can live without this ubiquitous specter of disproportionate structural violence. And I'll break down that jargon. It's just when we deprive people of health and well-being just based on their identity and their geography. If you could go to the next slide, Jacob. There's a quote here, I won't read all of it, but uh, Dr. Ruha Benjamin is an associate professor in African American studies at Princeton University. And she says something that I want you to really hold on to. The facts alone will not save us. I bet most of you on this, on this call already know that. The facts alone will not save us. Um, and she goes on to talk about novel fictions, but fictions in this sense, y'all, is not about falsehoods, but reimagining reimaginings and refashionings um, using speculative methods, challenging ever-present narratives of inevitability, and anticipating new formations, such as new racial formations, and to test out different possibilities for creating what we would like to see just in equitable societies. So that's a little bit about how we go about creating uh, new narratives um, with Narrative Initiative. And um, I'll pass along to Liz to talk about um, what this might look like in real time. Yeah, so we wanted to um, close out this presentation, um, kind of acknowledging that this is a, it's a strange, it's a strange discipline and, and in some ways it's a bit abstract. Um, and people are hungry to do this work. I think it's one of the things that we've heard over and over again as we've spoken with people, as we've met with groups, as we've run our trainings. Folks are hungry for this, but then they also are like, what, how do I do it? What, how do I get started? What's going to happen? So we want to, there, there are lots of different pathways in. That's what I want to acknowledge um, at the beginning, because this is an interdisciplinary practice, because it's an interdisciplinary approach to making change. Um, but there are many different ways to move into this space. And frankly, everybody has something to contribute, right? Um, but we, ha we do have a process that we offer, which we call um, the nor a North Star process, charting a North Star. Um, this process is, as Marcus was uh, describing, rooted in the future. It embodies a polyvocal, uh, translocal um, kind of uh, ethos and polyvocal, it's many voices. Translocal means this narrative can travel. It can be right sized to your place your geography, the specificity of the moment. Um, and so charting a North Star is about um, having those deep conversations with the folks that you're in relationship with 
um, and really focusing on the future so that we can step out of like the, the, um, the rapid response uh, and day-to-day -day moments that we are in. I saw so many people in the chat talking about, I'm exhausted, but I'm hopeful. I'm regrouping after the primary. I'm, uh, you know, I'm healing, I'm recovering. Um, we, everybody does really hard jobs. Communications especially is a very, very hard, urgent job often. So when we are asking people to step into this North Star process, it's to step out and to look forward and talk about where we want to go together, right? Um, Jacob, if you can go to the next slide. Um, through a process like a North Star, again, as Marcus was describing, we hold essentially kind of futures visioning um, uh, uh, activities. We gather up that information um, in community and surface, okay, what is the North Star? Where are we going together? Uh, we think about the North Star as not a campaign, campaign slogan, not a bumper sticker, right? At the end of this type of process, you're not going to have like save the whales to go on the back of your, uh, onto the back of your bumper, a bumper of your car, if you have a car or your bike or whatever. Um, it is a orienting device. It is something, as we've talked about over uh, the course of this um, presentation, that is related to a longer time scale. It should be durable, it should be a guidepost, an inspiration, and a marker of alignment between you and the other folks that you're working with, that you say, no matter what happens, we're going this way together. Um, and I, I love that um, quote that you used, Jacob, to talk about loyalty and fidelity to this idea of a North Star, here's where we're going together. Um, and through that process, um, folks develop a shared understanding of the deep narratives that are important to them, uh, that they want to advance over time, their values, and they also get to identify and build and deepen their alignment with each other while they're doing work in real time. So again, the North Star serves as this orienting tool that can help us tr track and continue to focus on the future throughout all of the wins, losses, struggles, and fights that we are involved in in the day-to-day -day of our work. Um, so I wanna pause there and I'm gonna pass it back to Marcus for, um, for the close. Certainly, thank you uh, for showing how we chart towards a narrative North Star, Liz. So investing in this work, if we do it right, it'll leave us with more durable infrastructure. It'll give us the ability to pivot between campaigns and important moments uh, with durable relationships. Narrative change is drawing from the power of alignment of shared values and worldviews, or as we call it, deep narratives. And these deep narratives give structure to our narratives, which help make sense of the stories, the messages, and the images. If you go back to that ocean metaphor, thinking about how all of these are interrelated, but also very distinct. And all of this work takes time. And we are working with a long time horizon. Uh, whether we take into account the idea of the long haul by Miles Horton or this quote uh, that you see by Brian Eno, it's embedding and, and embodying this philosophy um, that I believe comes from the great law of the Haudenosaunee people that says, in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. In, every in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. So this work is some long haul work. With that, we would just like to uh, thank you all for giving us some time and space to share with you. I'll close with this last quote um, by Ruha Benjamin. Remember, to imagine and craft the worlds you cannot live without. Remember to imagine and craft the worlds you cannot live without, just as you dismantle the ones you cannot live within. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Marcus, Jacob, and Liz. I hope everybody had a chance to learn a lot. I know we have a lot of you still in the room. We're nearing the top of the hour, but with your permission, Jacob, Liz, and Marcus, if we can borrow a couple minutes past top of the hour for your, of your time, let's try to get to as many questions as we can. Does that work for you all? 
I'm seeing nodding. Okay, great. So let's start with a question from, from Stephanie, uh, who asks, how are you measuring the impact of narrative change efforts? And gang, if you want to add your questions to the mix, you can do so. We're in the Q&A box. You can also vote for questions there. Who wants to take a swing at that one? How are we measuring the effectiveness of narrative change? Um, well, this is quite a tricky question, and it's one that we get quite often. Um, I want to point to uh, two things, um, uh, and then I'll make a little bit of space for my colleagues if they want to layer on top of it. One is that we find that the four baskets is a way that is quite helpful for breaking up the component parts of looking at narrative change and where you might be having impact. Um, there are also, so like when you think about the translate, uh, when you think about the create basket, the translate basket, deploy, observe together, all of these uh, types of, uh, all of these baskets have activities that are attached to them that include kind of work in policy advocacy and organizing, they include communications uh, metrics, they include, you know, uh, in some instances, like measures of trust, like are the folks that you're working with trusting each other? Are they starting to do collective work? Um, so, and I think that there are also places from collective impact um, measurement that you could take into this space. Uh, I do want to flag that there was um, a report around measuring narrative change that, uh, that also pointed to the four baskets model that um, was developed um, by Rachel Whitinger, our, our program director. Um, the name of it is escaping me right now, but I will find it. I think it was the ORS report. If anybody else has a memory of that, um, I please help me out there. Um, and then I'll pause here and see if anybody else um, has a response. Jacob or Marcus, interested in jumping in? Uh, I thought Jacob was going to jump in, but I'll just say that um, um, Liz is, is quite modest. Um, uh, she has been our resident um, uh, kind of listener. Uh, we do some big listening to see whether or not the messages that, are, um, that networks are desiring to proliferate in the world, whether or not they're being taken up. And we can see the frequency of how um, certain ideas are tracking. We can also kind of take a look at um, how the opposition is responding to it to see if there's some heat. We uh, additionally, uh, she has been helping us to see where, where the networks are either cohered tightly in their communications or where they're diffuse in nature. And that gives us an indication of how much sharper we need to be in terms of our narrative change practice and who else we need to bring in, how we need to pivot. So that's one of the ways, but there are others who are far more adept at doing measurement than we. We're just using these in real time with active um, uh, movements to see how we might be able to get traction and build broader alignment towards taking big action. Yeah, and it's worth noting, folks in the social sector are not the only people who are working on narrative change. You're seeing this. This is what a political campaign oftentimes looks like every 40 years at the national level. But even more than that, y'all probably know this, but many people working in the defense sector of our economy, whether they're the CIA or special forces, they are actively, as part of their budgets, monitoring narratives in different parts of the world to understand when they enter into a space what that's going to look like. I actually found myself at a conference earlier this year and was stunned that every single person who started to talk started their conversation by saying, I am fill in the blank, and the dominant narrative in my space is X. And then they talked about whether they were disrupting it or not. And they had some indicators of how effective they were being. Perhaps the one that might be most familiar to you all, just anecdotally, that you've seen perhaps this in the news, is for, gosh, probably the last 60 years, the dominant narrative around the purpose of business in America has been the purpose of business is to create value for shareholders, to grow and, and, and develop more capital. Uh, BlackRock, I think, is one of the organizations that recently said they're disrupting that narrative. They actually think that their purpose is, is their, the narrative that they're going to be following and guiding all of their efforts is around the responsibilities that they owe to communities, the responsibilities they owe to the planet, and so on. Let's get to some more questions. Uh, Michelle asks, how do you recommend, and maybe this is a good place to go next, how do you recommend acknowledging and articulating the dominant narrative without reinforcing it? Who wants to take a swing at that? Jacob? Well, why don't I, uh, I start there. Um, in a lot of our work, I, I found that um, it's a lot easier for us to identify the dominant narrative. Um, and so in a lot of the sessions we've done, um, 
to help people create new narratives, we start by naming the dominant narratives before moving into the, some of the futures thinking and creative space that um, Marcus talked about. Um, but yeah, we really recommend uh, focusing on the positive narrative and trying to redirect towards our values and vision for the future rather than um, trying to negate or uh, kind of directly attack dominant narratives. Um, and that's part of why we focus so much on the future thinking is because so much of our messaging is focused on responding um, to the narratives that are coming um, at us. And we think it's really important um, when we step back in the space to reground ourselves so that we can pivot um, away from refuting dominant narratives towards, um, towards our actual, our own narratives, um, our vision and our values. Um, but it can be, I just want to acknowledge that that is really tricky work, especially in rapid response situations. Um, it's something we work uh, a lot with the groups in Minnesota on, and we're doing a lot of that in Pennsylvania this year as well. Um, so it's, it can be a challenge. Uh, Jeff uh, asks a question. Sorry. Oh, sorry, uh, Liz. Sorry, yeah. Can I layer on that really quickly? Yes, I, please. Um, I think uh, I just wanted to add to Jacob and uh, what Jacob says and say that identifying those dominant, those uh, core values that you or your organization or your group has and stating them very clearly um, is really, really important. And that's part of this alignment piece that we talk about, which is like, how are, how are people in relationship and partnership and coalition together? Let's be clear about our values. Let's be clear about the places where we're not going to violate our fat values and then decide. And by stating those things clearly, you can make a clear eyed decision about whether or not in this moment you cannot violate those values or you must because it, it, there's an emergency, right? Um, and I often think about this with like in when I used to work in the immigration space, there was so much tension about we need to get protection for the dreamers and we want to pass the dream act, but we also don't want to undermine the broader fight for making sure that there's a pathway to citizenship for everybody who doesn't uh, who's not authorized at that moment. Um, and so you see people struggling in, in rapid response in real terms to try to figure out when do we hold the line and when do we try to, to win something that's going, that's critical for people's health and safety. So it's a, not an easy question, but I think naming and articulating those uh, dominant narratives and the values that you're trying to advance is really key to, to helping people act together. Two quick thoughts just to add in before we get to the next question. So one is, uh, narratives are oftentimes, and we heard this sort of described in this way, they're the conventional wisdom. And we all have lazy brains. And the big challenge that we face when we're talking about narratives is that your brain is, is truly incredibly lazy. If you realize, like, just when you're asked something, your brain supplies an answer almost immediately. It's almost always built in a narrative framework. And trying to disrupt that is really hard. And it does talk about that deep time that we're talking about. This isn't something you can fix in a day. But why is this all relevant to the work that we're doing if we're working in foundations or nonprofits or social sector consultancies? I'll just anchor this in a little bit of data. So independent sector just today came out with a new report on trust in civil society. They specifically asked the question of people, do you trust foundations and nonprofits to be constructive forces in society? They did this back in 2016. This is the latest data that came out just today. You can probably find it on the independent uh, sector website. Maybe Carrie, you can toss it into the chat. But 81% of the people that they spoke to, and there were thousands of folks who were part of this, so it's a pretty credible poll. 81% believe that nonprofit organizations are constructive forces for good in society. And why is that relevant? Because it means that in order to communicate with people, you have to have a level of trust. Right? We don't listen to people that we don't trust. And so the real challenge here is we actually have quite an opportunity in front of us if 81% of the people in America, which presumably crosses ideological spectrums, allows us to say, we, they want to hear from us and they're interested in what you have to say. And it's probably anchored in values at the end of the day. That's not something they looked at. Now, the number's a little bit no lower if you're working in a foundation, but these are still super, super majorities. If you're in the business of polling, 68% of people saying foundations are a constructive force for good in society is an extraordinary number. And just to be, give you one more piece of data, just to help you put this in context, the number of people who trust, let's just put a couple of things around this, businesses, banks, government, your members of Congress, probably sitting down around 20% or so. So we are talking about extraordinary trust that built, that sits inside of the organizations that we serve. And there's a real opportunity there. All right, so I, I'll get off the soapbox. Let's get to the next question. Uh, Jeff says, without putting too fine a point on it, are you using narrative to essentially mean theme? Um, my quick answer is no, but I'll go to the experts here. Uh, Jacob, you're unmuted, so we'll put you on the spot first. Narrative is not um, a theme. yes or no. 
<laughs> no, no I, I don't think of narratives exactly as a theme, a theme so much as a big idea. Um, and ideas, uh, they have both a valuative component, they communicate what we value about, and they also communicate about what's true. And so um, I think about a narrative as an idea that, that, that kind of brings up some of our values um, and some of our ideas about the way the world should work from that deep narrative level. Um, so, uh, and we also, uh, we have a report um, on our website, um, Towards New Gravity, which talks a little bit about our definitions, which I'd recommend folks check out um, and could be another resource for digging in a little deeper on some of the ideas we talked about today. Marquez or Liz? Nope. No, we're good. Okay, so let's get to the next couple of questions. I know we're seven minutes past the hour, so perhaps we can make this the last question, but you can see the emails right here. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and be presumptuous and say, Liz, Marquez, and Jacob, you put those up there because you're happy to talk to folks. Okay, great. You can also probably find them on Twitter as well. But let's make this the last question. So our friend Jenny out in Nashville asks, Marquez mentioned the future's thinking needs to be done in more than just individual spaces. How do we reach a place where we can discuss the future as a nation or in larger segments when a significant amount of people are not being honest or are unaware of the realities and narratives that currently exist? I always think of narratives as sort of like the matrix has you. You're not thinking about them. They just exist and they go mostly unexamined. So how do we start to help people understand that? Yeah. And maybe this moment is one of those moments. It, it's interesting. I'll get us started and um, uh, pivot to my uh, partners. I think that one of the ways that we at Narrative Initiative have done it is by strategically aligning with, with um, movements and networks that are already in motion at a particular scale. So once those are either cohered, already aligned networks, or we're helping to build alignment within said network, we will then engage in a futures thinking process with them to start envisioning what the world should be. Um, so we can sh find, we can suss out what the shared values are, the sh shared worldview. Um, but if you're asking like how you might do that outside of say this kind of context, um, taking it all the way back to um, the local level, if it were my story, I might start these kinds of circles with my, uh, with my community, whether in uh, communities of faith or communities of, of tradition, um, and, and culture and share around what their vision of the future should be like as a means to articulate how they want to go to say the city council or the school board, right? First getting clear about what the vision of the future is. So it means getting folks together, allowing each person to kind of share, building from there to find where, where the common themes are. Um, we, we're gonna have to go all the way to sometimes to the building blocks of organizing 101 on the local level, you know, and around our kitchen tables with our families who disagree with us vehemently sometimes, um, but also in ways that that render certain lives uh, so vulnerable that we don't know if our tomorrow will uh, will be, you know, because our lives could be taken at any moment. That is not a, a discussion that we should be having these days, but we are. And so, how then do we create a future like that? Start with folks who are close up on you. Uh, organize from there and build the kinds of futures, reverse engineering, finding out what the coherent narr narratives are that need to be changed in the present to bring those futures into reality. Hope that's helpful. Otherwise, you can always email me uh, and you can find that email on the slide. I would be glad to nerd out with you, especially from a fellow Tennessean. Yeah, unmute myself. Yeah, the, the, gang, the, the bottom line is when we're talking about narrative work, we're talking deep geek. Like you have to be willing to go there. There's the intersection of psychology, social science, even just the way brains, uh, the work of the perception is too fabulous place to go to start to understand how we all receive information, interpret it and make sense of it. Um, next question comes from Veronica. I, I can answer the first part of this, but I'm going to leave you all for the challenge here. Can you give successful examples of narratives that envision a better world for justice and equity, a healthy planet, feminism related? I can give you a negative narrative that's dominated the perhaps the last 20 some years of our lives, which is the narratives that emerged after 
right? There were three big narratives, I think, that emerged in the wake of 9-11, and they've shaped the way we've made investments as a society, as individuals, as organizations. There are narratives around safety and security, and those are usually intertwined, right? And then a narrative that started to emerge almost the day after 9-11 about othering, which I think has probably led to a generation of xenophobia and, and deep racism in this country, perhaps around the globe. Um, that's a negative version of dominant narratives that erupted after a big event, but but can one of you come up with a couple of happier examples, perhaps? Jacob, you're unmuted, so I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> well, I, I was uh, just looking for the link um, to the article that Liz and I wrote. We, we talk a little bit about um, a couple deep narratives that we thought were really important to forward um, in this pandemic moment. Um, I'll just mention one of those. Um, you know, I, people are talking about how do we get to this level of deep narrative? Well, crisis is a great moment. Um, people are talking about the pandemic as a spotlight. And I think one of the things that it's showing is um, uh, how much work that is essential is undercompensated, unseen, um, and done by folks who are, are not, yeah, they're not making money and they're often um, people of color. And so now is a great moment to tell an affirmative story about um, the fact that all work and all workers um, matter and that we need to compensate them fairly um, and make them and provide appropriate protections for them in the workplace. So that's one narrative that we lifted up in that piece. Um, but I, there's several others that you can check out uh, there as well. Liz, Marquez? Marquez, you want to go? We get this question a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it's hard, I think, um, you know, I, I think it's hard in like the past 30 years to look at like a ton of examples that point to um, really significant um, change in dominant narratives. Um, I'm a millennial, I, you know, so thanks Reagan. Um, but I think that what you see is, and, and I think this it speaks to like the contest piece of it, which is that, um, there are things that have changed, right? And I think uh, when you see like the rapid change um, around the understanding of our relationship to the environment, um, the narrative that uh, was dominant around the environment in the late 60s and the early 70s, the policy change that was able to be achieved, um, some of the changes in behavior, though not all, um, was pretty, pretty quick and pretty exciting. Um, and then that work I think was, um, if you think about that work, it's uh, that there was a, a movement towards health, there was a movement towards safety in our communities, there was a movement uh, from coming out of the workers' rights spaces about protecting health and having worker protections, which built on a, a continuing narrative around labor struggles um, from earlier in our country's history, um, that converged in order to make some pretty significant changes. That uh, narrative or that that deep those deep narratives about safety were contested i think in the 80s around narratives about the role of government right so you see that these deep narratives can be in tension with each other one can get foregrounded while the other is backgrounded and it changes kind of what our political social and cultural environments are there are dominant narratives that were changed before our lifetimes around whether or not it was appropriate to own somebody um, which we think, I think have significantly shifted or dominant narratives around gender that have significantly shifted, not just in the feminist movement, but prior to that and building on these longer kind of historical fights about who is included and who is not. But it is, it's a tricky, it's tricky, especially with time scale to think about um, where some of those successes are. But those are some that I would point to where we have a significantly different lens on some of those issues than we did in say the 19th century. <laughs> Maybe an example, our, our colleague Eric Brown jumped into the chat uh, and he suggested that marriage equality, uh, not only here in the United States, but in Ireland and more recently in Australia is a wonderful example there because they actually had to, at first, the folks working on these issues had to understand what the dominant marriages were and then ultimately disrupt them. And in the case of marriage equality in the United States, the challenge was that when advocates were first going after marriage equality, I think the first credible thought was Prop 8 in California back in 2008. And y'all may remember uh, that same year that Barack Obama was elected president, California rejected a ballot initiative that everyone expected to pass that was going to make California the first state to legalize and recognize marriage uh, for gay and lesbian couples. Uh, and it didn't happen. 
And what they ended up doing was a bunch of researchers went back and saw, where did people get stuck? What happened? And there were a bunch of narratives that were around uh, safety, around quote unquote traditional family values. And the way advocates had approached that messaging and, and even the narratives that they were challenging, they seemed to be in the minds of many, many people. I think this was Lisa Grove who did a lot of this research found. Uh, and again, we'll go deep geek with you because you can read all about this online if you wish. Uh, what they found was that in Prop 8, the messaging that was done uh, by a number of advocacy groups focused on fairness. And specifically, they'd been a big campaigns about the 1,132 rights and benefits that confer to straight couples when they get married, and that those ought to be extended to everybody as a civil rights or as a fairness issue. And it turned out the way people interpreted that, they didn't hear that message. What they heard was, you're trying to change the institution of marriage which has a deep narrative around it, right? And it was only when we shifted or when advocates started thinking about and examining some of these narratives and shifting some of the messaging to align with the dominant narratives that they actually found some wins in what was it, Maryland, Maine, Minnesota, and Washington state. And the messaging there was aligning with the dominant narrative. It was about joining the institution of marriage. It was about love and commitment. And you can remember President Obama evolved and spent a lot of time talking about love and commitment, those, those narratives that exist there. So sometimes it's not about disrupting narratives, it's about finding out what they are and finding your way into them. Sometimes we're actually, turns out, knocking on the wrong door or using the wrong key to get in the door. Um, I think we probably have to leave it there. Uh, any closing thoughts, question you wish someone had asked you, Jacob, Liz, or Marcus, before we jump and let everybody back into their afternoons? I'm seeing Marcus. No, I just want to uh, thank all, all the folks who uh, asked questions in the Q&A. Um, if you've not peeped in there, this is a good place to see. Uh, we have a number of uh, folks, including Rachel Weidinger, who devised the four baskets, um, responding to some of the questions, but just a deep debt of gratitude to ComNet and to you, Sean, for holding space for us and for all, uh, all those who've made this possible. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot. We're going to have to have you back because this is a really important piece. And it is absolutely, if you work in a communication shop, this is your work. It's not only your work, as we talked about. It's the work of CEOs, board members, other people and staff. I used to work for John Podesta, and he got it drilled into everybody's head. If you work in my organization, you're in the communications business, regardless of what your title is. So uh, maybe we can leave it there. But I, there's a lot more to discuss here because this really is a necessary piece of the way I think each and every one of us thinks about our work. And again, just go back to that independent sector poll, which I saw someone put in the chart. This is a place where we can have tremendous impact, not tomorrow and maybe not next week, but if we commit ourselves to it over the next decade or two, we have a incredibly gorgeously beautiful amount of capital that we can spend. Uh, people think well of the organizations that we all serve and that we work with and that we work for. And so if we can do a little bit of good with that, this is the way we're going to do that. It's not just about the next press release or the next fundraising campaign. It's really about reshaping the way people see and perceive the world and what's possible. I'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Jacob, Liz, and Marquez for making the time for all of us. And we'll be back fairly soon. Look in your inbox. We'll tell you about V in the next couple of days. Be well, everybody. See ya.